So I'm an influenza virologist based at Imperial College London and there I run my research group. Um, primarily our focus is understanding pandemics and how they arise. Uh, all influenza viruses are present in birds uh, as a natural reservoir species but luckily for us they don't jump out of birds very frequently and, and cause pandemics in humans and what we want to understand are what are the primary barriers that prevent that from happening, what are the molecular transformations that the virus has to undergo to transform from being a virus that's locked in birds to one that causes these explosive pandemics in humans. So I've become increasingly involved in uh, communicating to the media primarily, so uh, very much through press office and also through the Science Media Centre, I'm on their advisory board and on their list of experts, quite often get inquiries from journalists, uh, from television, radio or the written press, who want to know a little bit more expert information or expert advice about various aspects of influenza outbreaks as they arise keeps us on our toes because the virus is constantly evolving both in terms of my own particular interest of pandemic evolution but also of course once a virus has come in from birds and it's become a pandemic virus in humans it then stays with us and turns into seasonal influenza that then drifts year on year and in some years causes bigger outbreaks than others and so journalists want to be able to tell the public really why that is what's going on how alarmed they should be so much of what I do is by sort of being an interpreter, if you like, of the basic science, uh, sort of trying to explain that to journalists so that then they can explain that onwards to their audience. One of the beauties about working with flu is, is that uh, it's a virus with which everyone's familiar and so you do have a huge audience of people who, who want to know more about it. Along with that comes the challenge that uh, everybody seems to have their own pet theory about flu themselves. It's, it's because it's so familiar. Uh, quite often I've gone, gone along to, um, for example, a lunchtime uh, session uh, for the lay public talking about the work and, and telling people the very latest. And then at the end of the session, somebody will come up to me and say, oh yes, but I don't get flu because uh, I boil an onion and inhale the juice overnight when flu season comes along or something like this. And, and so I think one of the biggest challenges about doing this is um, to separate out the sort of the, the folk remedies from the real science and, and politely sort of point out that, that there is some fundamentally really excellent science going on which is moving us forwards uh, in a way which is a little bit more sort of structured than, than eating bananas or boiling onions. Um, at the same time, of course, there are a lot of rumours and uh, conspiracy theories out there. Uh, for example, the vaccine world is always full of those. A lot of people think that uh, the flu vaccine doesn't work and therefore it's not worth getting. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that the flu vaccine that they're being offered by their GP uh, can't give them the flu. Uh, because it's an inert injection into their arm and it doesn't in any way resemble a, a replicating virus so they can't actually catch flu from having that and so just getting those basic messages out there I think is really fundamentally important but it is quite a challenge because people have already got one fixed idea in their head about what they think they know and so you've got to undo that fallacy first and then start again from the basics. The swine flu pandemic of 2009 was a very busy time, uh, both for people working on the ground doing the proper science and for people like myself who could understand what was going on and could act as an interpreter to sort of allay the alarm of, of the public at that time. I mean, one particular thing I remember doing was um, for BBC um, News Round, uh, where the News Round journalist came along and interviewed me in the lab, uh, I guess to give credibility. Uh, and then there, afterwards there was a question and answer session being run for children who were a little bit scared about what was going on and wanted some reassurance about how dangerous swine flu was for them and what sort of precautions they should take about catching it or not and this kind of thing. So I think. Um, those sorts of messages are really important to, to be getting out there. And I think the point is that if you're a, a, an academic scientist who clearly knows what they're talking about, then you have the credibility to be able to reassure people in those circumstances. And that's where we can be valuable because 
at that time during the outbreak, actually, people like myself that work in universities are probably not at, at the cold face of it all. We're not the people who are collecting the samples and analysing them there and then. But we do have the time and space to actually contribute in that way. Uh, and then our time comes later when the outbreak is sort of, uh, let's say, more under control and we can understand the, 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 the basic questions of why did it come from and, and what's going to happen next. I, I mean, I think people are becoming more and more uh, realistic about the need to do this. I mean, you know, the, the classic example is, is the GM debate, where scientists did not come forward early enough and set straight some conspiracy theories and rumours. And as a consequence, we have really what I consider quite a mess in, in that area. So I think that, you know, scientists, particularly uh, helped by places like the Science Media Centre, are very much aware of the need to communicate science openly uh, and honestly to the public. We can't expect people to take up a new vaccine unless we tell them honestly what that vaccine is and what we know about it and why we're asking them to take the vaccine. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I'm going to talk about this afternoon is the new live attenuated flu vaccine that's being offered to children. And my personal opinion there is that people haven't really been uh, had ex explained clearly to them that the children are not at particular risk from severe outbreak of, of seasonal influenza, a severe case of seasonal flu. But the idea is that um, if we can control flu spreading in schools, we can almost certainly decrease the amount of flu that's spreading in communities and then vulnerable people uh, can be protected from, from that and the vulnerable people would of course get a much more severe infection were they to become infected. Yeah, I mean, I think the key to communication is keeping it simple, using straightforward language uh, and, and trying to put yourself in the, the place of the average lay, lay person. I mean, one of the things I've seen that's becoming more and more popular and I think is a great idea is this sort of idea of the three minute thesis where a PhD student is asked to explain what they're doing in simple terms in less than three minutes. And honestly, every scientist ought to be able to do that. If you can't say what you're doing and justify why you're doing it in simple language in three minutes, then probably you're not addressing the right questions anyway. So I think, um, yeah, the, the challenge for a microbiologist is not to use difficult names, not to drop in acronyms, uh, but to use words that everybody can understand and to speak in a very straightforward language. Because in that way, people don't feel you're pulling the wool over your, their eyes. They can actually understand what you're saying. And hopefully you can get along across some of the absolute fascination as well. I mean, you, microbes are invisible to us. And that makes them quite scary, actually. Uh, but it also makes them amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I am completely flattered uh, that I'm the person that's won this prize lecture. Um, there are many, many of my colleagues that get out there and do exactly what, what I do. Uh, I hope more of them will after seeing my lecture and, and sort of seeing how easy it is to do. Um, so many other people are deserving of this prize. I'm the lucky one that got chosen this year.